Hi, everybody, and welcome to NextGenInfra.io. So today we're diving into a major announcement from Broadcom that looks to be a, a big leap for AI infrastructure. It's their arrival of the sixth generation Tomahawk switching silicon. With this model, we're expecting to see major advance in AI clusters for the biggest hyperscale data center networks. Joining me today is Pete Del Vecchio, product line manager at Broadcom, who can walk us through this uh, big release. So first off, Pete, welcome. Yeah, Jim, thanks, good to be here. Okay, so let's start off with the headline. Why is Tomahawk 6 a breakthrough moment for ethernet in AI infrastructure and uh, a big release for Broadcom? Yeah, I think there are a few different factors. I mean, the first thing I think the big headline everyone sees is the bandwidth, the fact that it's 102 terabits per second. So this is you know double the bandwidth of any other ethernet silicon on the market. Um, this actually continues Broadcom tradition of more than a decade of being first to market at any particular bandwidth point. Um, and one thing is also impressive about Tomahawk 6 is not just that we've doubled the bandwidth of existing solutions, we also provide a variety of I.O. options to reflect the different topologies, the new topologies that we're seeing for GPU clusters. So we have a version with 200 gig CERTES, we have another version with 100 gig CERTES, and we will be releasing a version of Tomahawk 6 with co-packaged optics. So it provides a lot of flexibility for the physical topologies that we're seeing for these GPU clusters. And one thing that's actually, we've seen this fairly unique over the last couple of years is that there's a lot of engineering, a lot of custom design going into getting the most performance out of these GPU clusters. So that's one thing from the physical topology side that we're enabling. Okay. Um, another thing is what yeah, excuse me. So, so what, what kind of new design possibilities then are, are you looking at in terms of these AI clusters? So one thing that I'd say, you know, for previous generation systems, what you're seeing is very common that people would use a pizza box. So they'd have a single switch chip in a pizza box, interconnect those with DAC cables or with optics. You know, we've seen a lot of systems now where people want to have a very, very compact GPU rack or XPU rack. Well, they'll have GPUs in blades, I say above and below a series of switch racks or switch blades. And then you know, one thing that people are using Tomahawk 6.4 is within the rack for scale up networking. So scale up is where you have a, you know, a group of very tightly clustered GPUs that are communicating to each other, usually with cache line or memory transfers. So with Tomahawk 6, with the high bandwidth, the high radix, you can connect up to 512 GPUs with a single switch hop in a single you know, scale up domain. And that's about seven times the size of any other competing solution on the market. So I say as far as, you know, what are the new topologies? There's, you know, within the rack, you know, we have that, that you can now have a very, very large scale up domain. Again, just with a single switch hop up to 512 XPUs. And then once you connect those racks together in the scale outside with Tomahawk 6 in just two networking tiers, you can connect up to, or, you know, say 128K GPUs each one of them having a 200 gig interface. With any other networking silicon, you'd have to have three tiers of networking, which results in 67% more optics, 67% more physical interconnect and concurrent higher latency and higher power. Yeah, so with that very high radix, you're talking about very high density of ports. Um, and you, you've already mentioned um, a, a version with the CPO. So, you know, what, what does that end up looking like? Uh, as far as the, the we'll have the two ver So I can start off and actually show you, um, you know, this is a version of Tomahawk 6. This is the 200 gig, one, 200 gig 30s. Next one here is with 100 gig 30s. So much larger package because it's actually kind of a breakthrough for the industry that it has 1,024 30s on it. So it's double anything they've had before. Yeah. And to give you an example of what we've done before for CPO, um, I'll just reflect back to the previous generation. So this is a Tomahawk 5, electrically connected, and this is a Tomahawk 5 with CPO. So, you know, when you ask, you know, what would a Tomahawk 6 with CPO, we haven't publicly shown that yet, but you can imagine it'd be something very similar where we'd have a switch chip with, you know, this switch silicon towards the center, and then you have the optical engines around the periphery. And then basically that's all the optics for the system aside from an external laser source that we have for higher reliability and for field serviceability. Okay. Okay. So wanted to dig in next into another one of the major features that you're, you're highlighting here with this release, and that's the cognitive routing capabilities. Now, first, tell us about cognitive routing. It's a Broadcom innovation, isn't it? 
Yeah, yeah. So with cognitive routing, there's a suite of features that adds global intelligence to your routing decisions. Um, you know, there are a number of features in there. The one I think that uh, people kind of understand, you know, fairly readily and kind of generate a lot of excitement is called global load balancing. So this is one thing that Broadcom has innovated on over time is how you do the traffic management, how you do the load balancing in the system. So you know, if you're familiar with like ECMP, so equal cost multipathing, you know, that's probably like, you know, 10 year old technology. And you know, we've advanced to advanced ECMP and then we moved to dynamic load balancing where dynamic load balancing on a packet by packet basis, it looks at all the outgoing links from the switch determines which one is the light most lightly loaded, and then assigns the packet to that link. With GLB, or global load balancing, we actually have intelligence for the full network. So we can determine you know, what is the best global path through the network before assigning that outgoing link. So cognitive routing, you know, that GLB is just one feature that is going to use global intelligence to improve the routing decisions. And the net result that we've seen is compared to standard, say, static ECMP, to get about a 50% higher throughput through the network. And as far as failure resiliency, which is becoming increasingly important for these very large networks, you get about a thousand times faster response time to link failures compared to you know, standard ethernet protocols. Yeah, so it, it, what we're really talking about here is an enhancement to ethernet then, right? You're kind of making a enhanced version of it. So yes, yeah, it's, it's basically right in on top of the ethernet protocols and then figure out you know, standard ethernet you know, headers, standard ethernet protocols. What can we do at a system level? What can we do inside the switch to effectively do traffic management, load balancing. You know, this becomes particularly important for AI because, you know, before for general data center networks, people tended to run their networks in maybe 60 to 70% utilization. So it wasn't as critical to be, you know, the most efficient as far as load balancing and congestion management. With AI, you want to, you know, max out the network. You want to get as close to 100% utilization as possible. So for that, you really do need to have you know, very good telemetry. You need to get, you know, good traffic balancing or, you know, you know, load balancing and traffic management. So having those, you know, those cognitive routing features becomes, you know, increasingly important for AI, where you're really trying to get the most out of your network. Okay, and is this a, is cognitive routing um, a feature that will be used by all of your customers, or this is for some of them, for some designs? How does that work? I'd say you know, again, it's a suite of features, and I uh -huh. say that some of the features will be used by all customers. And then really depends on the network architecture and, you know, how advanced they are in trying to incorporate some of these features. What we found with our switch chips is that we'll introduce certain features and, you know, it'll take maybe a generation or two before some of the network operators really can roll it into their networks. Because a lot of them have their own means of doing con congestion control, you know, their own way of monitoring the network. So from our standpoint, it's like, yes, they will be using it. But you know, in some cases, it actually takes say, a generation before they roll that in. But once they do, they'll actually see an increasing benefits from that suite of features within that cognitive routing feature set. So how does um, Tomahawk 6 now fit into the you know broader stack that, that um, Broadcom is offering with, with Jericho and, and uh, Thor and others? Yeah, sure. Um, so I guess first off, you know, with, uh, say, Tomahawk and Jericho, so those are two different switch architectures we have for AI. Um, you know, and also we've seen that Tomahawk has traditionally been used in general hyperscale data center networks. The Jericho line has also found a lot of success in service provider. Now, we did, for the case of where it's used in AI, the way we look at it is the Jericho you know, series of, of switches would be used for something what we call a switch scheduled fabric. And then the Tomahawk would be used for an endpoint schedule. Now, as mentioned before, if you want to run your network at this, you know, 90 plus percent utilization, one thing that's key is you do need to schedule the traffic through the network. So with the Jericho family, you can have, you know, really dumb NICs or, you know, say Ethernet endpoints. And then the switch fabric, you know, starting with the Jericho devices would schedule all the traffic. So there's no need to do a load balance and reordering. I mean, that's all done within the, the Jericho device at its companion known as Ramon. But with Tomahawk, that's something where you might have a little bit more intelligence on the endpoints. Um, and that's what we see is that increasingly there is more and more intelligence being moved into the NICs and into GPU endpoints. So as far as, you know, intent portfolio, just starting with the switch, we have those two architectures really depending on what you want to see from 
the um, you know the the network architecture chosen by the hyperscaler. Okay. And then on the endpoint side, you know, we do have, as you mentioned, we have the Thor NICs. So those are discrete NIC devices. We also have NIC chiplets. So com companies that are working with Broadcom for custom ASICs, and we can provide a NIC chiplet they can drop into the design. And then the third thing we have on the endpoint is we do provide this scale up Ethernet framework. We will provide IP, provide a framework that if you want to roll your own Ethernet interface, we'll give you guidance on how that can be incorporated into your design. Okay. Okay. Interesting. And finally, we're looking forward to what's next. And, and here, I'd be interested to hear your comments on kind of what's next for the industry. We see, you know, a number of different initiatives like Ultra Ethernet coming along. And then, you know, what's next on the marketing rollout side um, in terms of, you know, when will we see platforms based on Tomahawk 6 in the yeah. market? So I think, you know, Broadcom has been, uh, so we were, we were one of the founders of the Ultra Ethernet Consortium. Um, you know, it's kind of public knowledge that the UEC spec will be released, for 1.0 spec will be released soon. So we've been major contributors towards that. And we'll be continuing to contribute to that. Um, you know, what you'll see is there are a lot of technologies that will be reflected in the 1.0 spec that are already incorporated in the Broadcom switches. So we'll continue down that path where we try to have the most innovative technologies wherever possible, try to standardize those you know, through UEC, through OIF, IEEE, et cetera. You know, as far as new initiatives, I think one thing that is in the current zeitgeist is what, what's going on as far as scale up networking. Um, so there's been a lot of buzz about that recently. And, you know, we firmly believe that the network or the industry will converge on Ethernet for scale up. You know, if you look at, you know, the, the, the you know, kind of populated before was that for the most efficient AI networks, you need to have Ethernet for your front end network. You need to have InfiniBand for the back end or scale out network, and then some proprietary link technology to scale up. You know, the debate is basically over as far as scale out. So now the front end and the, the back end are scale out. Yeah, you know, everyone's kind of you know converged on Ethernet for that. So the next question is, what do you do for scale up? And we're already seeing that customers want to have a unified network, a unified technology stack, unified set of tools, and have engineers that are, you know, understand one networking technology. So I say that's one of the big things we see that's happening this year is that people are moving more and more away. Again, like InfiniBand is you know gone from the scale out. It's basically Ethernet for front end, back end. And the next step is to get Ethernet into that scale up network. Awesome. And as far as uh, Tomahawk 6 products coming to market, what, what's the expectation? Yeah, this is this is interesting. I say, you know, when Tomahawk 5 was released, so it was August of 22. So just a few months later, in November 22, is when ChatGPT was announced. And I say, you know, initially with Tomahawk 5, you know, there's a lot of interest in it, saying like 51.2 terabits of bandwidth. That's a lot of bandwidth. I'd like to have that in my network, but I'm not sure what I'm going to do with it immediately. ChatGPT came out. Everyone had to have a Gen AI story, and things just changed where people had to deploy the highest bandwidth as quickly as possible. Tomahawk 6, we're definitely in that realm, where everyone we talk to is like ODMs, OEMs, you know, the hyperscalers. They absolutely have to be, you know, first to market. So we're seeing a very, very aggressive adoption of Tomahawk 6. So my expectation is that you're going to see very large clusters being deployed using Tomahawk to both scale up and scale out in the first half of next year. You know, one thing that with, I think was interesting is just uh, and we do get a lot of questions about is, you know, why do we have multiple versions with 100 gig and 200 gig? You know, this is something that, you know, what we've seen in general is that our switches tend to run without twice the speed of IEEE as far as defining new, you know, city speeds. Yeah. So Tomahawk 4, we had a version with 50 gig, a version with 100 gig. Tomahawk 5 was kind of squarely in the 100 gig generation. Uh -huh. And then Tomahawk 6 is also kind of a bridge generation. But, you know, what's been interesting is that with Tomahawk 4, whereas we saw a lot of adoption with the lower speed CERTES, we're seeing people being a much more aggressive in adopting the new technologies. I mean, getting the high bandwidth, the bandwidth density, it's just, you know, an imperative for these AI systems. So I'd say even when we started on Tomahawk 6, we expected the 100 gig to be something that kind of really paved the way. And that was going to be something that it might take a while for 200 gig adoption. But you know, what we're seeing is that in addition, just the, the demand for higher bandwidth, you know, both on the scale up and scale outside, there's also a large movement towards these very, you know, fully engineered systems. You know, kind of what, what I mentioned before that with Tomahawk 5, it used to be pizza boxes, you know, cable them up with your, your DAC cables or with optics. You know, we're seeing people just, you know, doing everything possible to get like the most performance. You know, one, because you want to pack the GPUs within the rack as, you know, as densely as possible. The other thing is that you know, these data centers are running out of power. 
So yeah. where can you save power? It's if the GPU is what it is as far as power. So then you try to save power in everything else. So you improve the PUE, the data center, by having better cooling, better electrical supply. And then you try to take you know, as much power out of the network as possible. And that's going to be by going to higher bandwidth, by using more passive copper, and also CPO. And one thing, I'm not sure if you know, Manish had mentioned this, but CPO is pretty well known that people is interested in it for like lower power and for lower cost. You know, the one other thing that, that could move the industry very rapidly towards CPO is that we're seeing in a lot of cases, it can dramatically reduce the link flaps in the system. Yeah. And, and I'm, are you familiar with the link flaps? That was a, a major topic at, at that Optica event at OFC, right? There are a number of questions that came came on that, that if you have link flaps, then the performance of the network that takes a big hit. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the Optica event, I think it, I know Oracle at, you know, it's kind of OFC that happened concurrently. I mean, they had one presentation where it was just about link flaps and all the issues they're having and trying to mitigate it. And so what we're seeing is that, you know, with co-packaged optics, since you have uh, the optical fiber coming straight out of the chip, going into another chip, there's no read timers, there's no active components in between. It's just, you know, an optical link. So you know, what we've seen in our experimentation and what hyperscalers have seen is that you actually wind up with a more stable link without having those active components in between and potentially a dramatic reduction in link flaps. So while the lower power is interesting, you know, while the lower cost of optics is, of the CPO is interesting, I think, you know, if you can actually get better performance out of your GPU cluster, that could be a game changer. I imagine you'd need a, a lot of data before you know exactly yeah. how it's going to perform. And these, these data centers that people are talking about are so massive in size that, yeah. you know, do you have to build it before you know like how it's going to perform? Or can <clears> you <throat> simulate it enough to before the build happens? Yeah, I mean, that, that's an interesting question. That's one thing I think with CPO is that people have looked at the results theoretically and said, hey, that looks great on paper. They're not going to believe simulations. I mean, they're basically, they've got to actually deploy it. Now, I'd say you don't necessarily have to deploy a full data center, but you're going to want to have, you know, millions of device hours. So you can have, you know, two switches talking to each other or, you know, a few hundred switches that are talking to each other. It doesn't have to be a full data center build out, but then with that, you can collect the statistics because the optics is going to be the same it's going to have the same performance, regardless if it's, you know, in a lab <clears throat> where the switches are talking to each other, just, you know, running in a sandbox versus running a, a real data center. Yeah. A lot, a lot of interesting things going on here. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm also kind of curious about whether um, the different vendors then who are, are your customers, and I know hyperscalers are your customers as well, the, the space for innovation or differentiation between different data center network implementations. Yeah, I'd say um, as far as the, the that is actually one thing we're seeing quite a bit is that, you know, because of this need to get like the ultra high density as far as, you know, individual rack, as far as a cluster, um, we are seeing a lot of innovation in the, the physical design. So uh, the way that they're actually constructing the, you know, the cooling systems, the way they're doing the electrical interconnect, there is a lot of custom engineering going on there, I mean, much more than previous generations. And then I think as far as, you know, as getting back to that point where it was like general data center networks, you run them at 60 to 70% utilization. AI, you're trying to get like, you know, 95, 100% utilization. In order to do that, you have to have really good telemetry. You have to have really good congestion control. So that's one of the things that we provided with Tomahawk 6 is, you know, just advancements in how we can do the load balancing, you know, how we can do the, you know, the adaptive routing within the switch, but then also providing a lot of flexibility to the endpoints so that way, vendors and hyperscalers can differentiate in how they're scheduling traffic and how they're managing the network. Right. Well, excellent. Thank, thanks again for your, your comments and your, your um, insights here on next generation switching. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. It was All great right. chatting with you. 